Yeah, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so this is uh, this is the weather report, uh, store development. So we'll introduce ourselves. I'm Nicole, and I am the store planner and designer, uh, equipment specs, and interior design. And I'm Kevin O'Donnell. I do store operations and prepare foods. And I'm Joel Kapischke, and I do uh, governance and leadership and project management and um, and I help out uh, with all the store development uh, that we do um, as seven rooms. I want you to click the next slide. Right. Let's see. And we also have um, in the picture um, uh, Heather Leskis, uh, who's our general manager, and uh, she also does marketing and branding. Um, and it pretty much is hands on in all the work we do. We, we, we roll as a team. So, and what we do, um, Seven Roots, it, we, we help open and run stores. So through um, feasibility, store design, development, programming, interior design, prepared foods, operations, I cover all the big ones, uh, you know, like I said, governance, that sort of stuff. So, so what we're gonna try to cover today <laughs> is um, the weather report. What changes are we seeing? And what are the impacts on our industry? And then the store development trends and pivots that are going on to adjust to those industry impacts. Um, and we'll specifically highlight store programming, prepared foods, and then how to be ready. Um, what, the, what does this all mean for startups and um, if we have questions while we go while we're going along we don't have 75 minutes of content that we're going to try to try to slam at you um, so there's time if you've got questions as things come up and then well we also have time for general questions at the end um, but before we go on I forgot this in our introductions let's find out who you all are too so we all know we all know who's here. So um, so why don't we start with Kate here in the front? I'm, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Kate one. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who got here late, sorry, yeah, missed all that joke. And I have no son named Jerry. But <laughs> my name is uh, Jerry Haptis, yeah. and I am with Prairie Food Co-op in the Chicago suburbs. I am Katie Weimer with Whitewater Grocery Co. from Whitewater, Wisconsin. Dave Olson from National Club Grocers. Kate is Rogers from Sitka Food Co-op in Sitka, Alaska. Gina Marie from Rooted Carrot, Cedar Falls, Iowa. Grant Kessler from Chicago Market. I'm Punch and Scott with Red Green Partnership in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Kate Christensen um, with Free Range Food Co-op in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. I'm Mary Meyer with Wild Onion Market in Chicago. Angie Harrington, um, Bay City Cooperative Market in Michigan. Yeah, sure, what the heck? Um, my name's Nick. I just graduated from UW. <laughs> Go back. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm Al. Thank you for video. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> I'm Allison Mindstrom. I'm with Shared Capital. Okay. Just in time, we're doing intros. Perfect. <laughs> I don't know. It's you. It's your turn. Oh, it's my turn. Yeah. Cool. Um, hi, I'm Nina. I'm hailing from Kingston, New York, um, where I am a council member, and I'm excited to be here. It's my first time here. Awesome. Great. So, um, so when we start to talk about the weather report, uh, we're we're implying that there's changes on the horizon, right? And, and we're, we're gonna talk a little bit about what those changes are. Um, and potential, and, and, and we're gonna focus on uh, some of the, the bigger picture global type uh, components to this. So uh, obviously anybody who's been in a grocery store uh, never wants to see that. Except the prices. Yeah, the prices, the prices are great but the empty shelves are not. And uh, in, in the co-op world, we call that negative space. Not very, 
not good. But so what are the market forces that are really affecting grocery stores right now? Not enough drivers. So labor, houses, right? Labor. labor issues. What else? Supply. Um, yeah. You know that? So here's a, here's a fun fact. He's wearing a Ukraine shirt with sunflower uh, on it. Does everybody know that between Russia and Ukraine, they produce 75% of the sunflower oil for the world? <laughs> so potato chip companies are like, we're going we're gonna to downsize because we can't produce all those potato chips. Fish and chips, and income. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so severe supply chain issues. Um, inflation. How does inflation affect affect what we do? Customers. Buying power. Buying power. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so we'll talk about inflation a little bit later, but it has a dramatic effect on us, and it sometimes it appears to be smoke and mirrors. But we'll talk about that. Well, and, and for those of you who might not know this about about the uh, food store business, we are not a cash rich industry, <laughs> so inflation is gonna hit us. Yeah, um, and we all know everybody's talking about the labor shortage, so we don't have to beat that. But there's also a climate crisis right now, and you know that is gonna come down the pike in the future. I live in California, and we've had our earliest fire ever. There's one going right now that has shut down the entire town that's in. So uh, we're doing the weather report on store development. So we should probably define the term um, store development. And for for today's conversation, um, it's the process of creating a roadmap from inception through store opening. So it, and it includes the, so it's, it's kind of the whole thing from, you know, from the, your first idea when you thought about it to the doors are open and running. So all of that is store development, everything that goes into getting there. And it includes the physical plans, the financial plans, um, industry data, external factors. All of these things are all part of the store development. And so we've talked a little bit about why we're seeing changes, and now we're going to talk about the changes and the challenges that we're actually seeing. So in terms of store development, construction materials, that's one of the biggest things. As a startup, you might find that you have an amazing plan, you've been working with an architect, and they're going to go bid out right, the project to all of their contractors. And the contractors might come back and be like, well, the cost of steel has gone up so much, we need to like." redo that and instead of use steel, use another product. And that's the same thing with all of the other products within the store and that also goes into the equipment, um, the decor, all the millwork and all that stuff that is going into the store, right? Labor is another thing, right? Like the supply chain distribution has affected everybody um, and a huge part of that is there's labor shortages. Um, there are more jobs in the US right now than there are people to fill them. And that is globally. Um, we've had you know, a million deaths here. Well, there are countries that have had multi-million deaths. And, and those are countries where we get a lot of our supplies from. Not necessarily our product, but parts of our product, right? Like sunflower oil. Um, but also we get our equipment parts. You know, China supplies a lot of things, Russia and Ukraine does, and they're just seeing incredible changes in their labor field. Yeah, I want to jump in a little quick story here. Um, so you were talking about like the price of steel. So um, the co-op was recently in, in development and they got the quote for steel. And so they had basically three options at that point. Uh, change our financial picture and pay the extra for the steel. Find an alternative that would work. Um, and then that alternative pretty quickly turned into a third option, which was, well, if we're doing an alternative, we need to redesign because it's not just a swap in. So then, and then when you think about redesign, then some of the ordering, you start the calendar again on that. 
and you have to, you know, then everybody, everybody who does the little drawings, all those professionals who do the little drawings have to come in, they have to redo mechanical engineering, all that stuff, you know, so it's just like, it's a really tough decision. Um, yeah. So, so. And every inch, every half an inch really makes a huge difference and it impacts your plan. If you have to move a case or you have to move some of your millwork six inches, everything that surrounds it needs to move as well. And so we have a store that is redoing some of their um, building supplies, right? And they had columns. And they used to be eight inch columns. Well, wrapping those columns was going to be too expensive, so now they're 12 inch columns. So that affects all of our aisle widths, and that affects all of our perimeter aisles, and so we had to adjust the fixture plan after we were already in the construction bidding process. Out of stocks and supply chain disruptions, we've already talked a little bit about that, as well as the labor shortages. Um, all right, and there's, you know, obviously, uh, my shopping patterns have changed in the last few years. Probably a couple times, right? <laughs> a couple times, at least. Um, and in some cases, uh, shopper expectations have, have returned. You know, um, and in some cases, they stayed to what they changed to during during COVID. So operations is, is facing a lot of challenges. Uh, Kevin is also operations manager at Hunger Mountain, so he lives and breathes this every day. Maybe breathe isn't the right word. Um, I'm living the dream every hates. day. Some living the dream every day. Living the dream every day. Um, and uh, and then another change that we're seeing is. Um, more, uh, well, a different different models and approaches to, it used to be um, at Up and Coming, a lot of folks were doing similar things just in different places. And we're seeing a lot of different approaches now. Um, we're seeing, we're seeing um, a lot more folks um, in traditionally redline communities, um, you know, food insecure areas, and they're coming in with, um, with maybe foundational partners that are supplying some of the funding. We're seeing more grant money being applied. Um, and when you think about store development, when all of a sudden you have an outside partner, well, that's another, that's another voice, another vote perhaps, another, you know, when you're thinking about grant stuff, it's like, okay, now we apply and we wait. <laughs> um, and, and so that can affect, that can affect your timeline. And also regulations, right? Uh, yeah, also grant regulations. Sure sometimes you know, grant money yeah. is, is very specific. Um, and sometimes it's um, a, a lot of grant money is you have to go do this work and then we'll reimburse you. Yeah. So that affects your financial planning as well. It's like, yay, we get free money. Oh, but we still have to pay for all this stuff up front. So it just it affects your planning. And so there used to be kind of a here's the model for, for development and kind of how you have to plan things out. Well, with these, with different models and, and different missions, we're seeing, we're seeing lots of variations and it's cool and exciting um, to see communities that have been without grocery, you know, on the path to getting grocery again. And um, it's, a different, it's a different store development model. Yeah. And we're seeing um, in some of the, especially in some of these places, more small format stores. And again, the focus on affordability and access um, and a lot of the reasons we're seeing this is a result of the pandemic. People in small, marginalized communities have not been able to get food, right? So they wanted to come up with a sustainable method to provide for their community, and that's coming in the format of like smaller C stores or like 2,000 plus, you know, between two and 5,000 square feet. Um, they are more conventional, natural hybrids, and it's more about food access than it necessarily is about natural and organic. And we'll actually talk about this more a little bit um, in another couple of slides here. So. Yeah, so so when we we start to talk about all this stuff, how does this affect store operations? So, you know, we've already talked about climate, we talked about uh, supply chain, we talk about inflation. You know, what happens on the ground? Yep. Any thoughts? You think we're operating stores the same way? No. I think you have to be really attentive to your costs. Mm -hmm. Usually yeah. attentive. Yeah. So what we're seeing, I mean, cost of goods uh, goes up on the back end. So 
we need to make a certain margin on our products, so we raise the prices. Okay. I recently paid twelve dollars for a jar of non-organic mayonnaise. <laughs> yeah, nine dollars for like half a gallon of milk. And my partner works at uh, Briar Patch, which is a large co-op, and even with his discount, it was nine dollars for a half a gallon. Yeah. And so we have higher prices. We have a demand for higher wages, right? Not high wages, just mm -hmm. higher wages. Yeah. Um, you know, we're seeing a long overdue, um, you know, uh, boost to wages uh, because of the labor shortage. It, it, you know, there's still many, many people obviously working below a living wage, um, and you know, a lot of our food co-ops struggle to pay a living wage um, because of because of some of the pinch points in in operations. Yeah. And so just. Uh, I'll just clarify. Does everybody understand what a margin is? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, good. I just don't want to throw up terms and have somebody sit there. And, um, um, and because we have lower margins, we have lower profitability. And as you know, when you look at a store, the the store has um, it has you know their fixed expenses that they have to pay for, right? Um, um, and here's the piece about inflation. So. You know, inflation, um, depending on how you look at it right now, it can be anywhere from six to eight percent. So, we raise prices based on inflation. So our sales go up, right? So we're sitting saying, "Oh, sales are up four percent. It's really great," but it's really not because it's all smoke and mirrors. Because when you start to look at higher wages, lower margins, all those things eat into that increase, and so. At the end of the day, you know, you're you don't really increase your sales. You gave a great example of what you've experienced at Hunger Mountain the other day. Yeah, so you know, uh, we won't go too far down this, but we do twenty six million dollars in sales, roughly at Hunger Mountain. Um, if if uh, if we if we have to pay our staff. Uh, another, like, let's say 5%, right? So for us, that's roughly $7 million. <laughs> and we're, we're predicting only a 3% increase in sales. So it's not a 3% increase in profit, right? Yeah, yeah. So it, it becomes, you just have to be careful and recognize it. That's really what we're, we're suggesting here. Okay, start well, development trends. We started to talk about this a little bit more. We uh, we unpack it even more here. Um, again, the the kind of traditional model that, that we saw was the natural food co-op uh, with more of a focus on organic and natural foods um, in typically uh, in typically wealthier neighborhoods. Um, and now we're seeing we're seeing um, a lot more. Like we said, food insecure areas, um, organizing and and trying to get grocery stores back in the community. We're seeing really community driven projects, um, different different formats, um, funding and development, and all of that. Um, so we're seeing again more small format stores. We're seeing stores that um, you know more convenience store size footprint. <laughs> Um, because it, its community hasn't had anything, so they're starting with starting with small access. Um, so the access and affordability less about um, less about natural and organic, more focused on fresh, um, and when possible local. Um, and and there's a number of there's a number of uh, you know. That often goes along with these community development projects is supporting entrepreneurs and producers and uh, urban gardening and things like that, where where it's all part of an ecosystem. Um, and and developing ecosystems can be more complex. So if you're in a project that's involved with that, um, but we're seeing we're seeing more of that in store development. And again, the funding and development, um, we're seeing grants and public funding and partnerships. Uh, and things like that, and so that means that we're we may be developing on someone else's timeline, 
and someone else's budget and someone else's conditions. Um, so it's just another, it, it can be a great boost and a benefit to have that partner and it can be another factor to consider. Um, but no matter you know what variation we've got going on here, the store development and equipment considerations are still obviously going to apply. And I'd add one other thing to this too, is that when you start to develop these partnerships, uh, partnerships are, are really uh, an important part of it because it can insulate you from some of the supply chain issues. So when you, when you partner with a lot of local vendors or farmers, mm -hmm. um, they're not into the same, you know, they're local. So at my co-op, we have over 500 local vendors that we, that we use. Now, my CFO says, I hate this because I have to write 500 additional checks to, to local producers that are, you know, on a scrap of paper that the farmer does or whatever. But it, and it's, and it's, more, it's more work for the buyers. Um, you know, so so a little bit more labor goes into it. You, most of us all agree that that it's a it's a positive thing, and there are costs associated with it as well. Yeah. And to add to that, when you have a supply chain disruption, all your local vendors are also dealing with this. So while you have maybe like two hundred that you're working with, if they can't supply consistent food, you need to have four hundred to work with, so that you have alternative vendors to fill your shelves. Yeah. And. One last piece at Hunger Mountain, we know that every dollar that is spent in our state, in our store, locally, gets multiplied by eight. Mm -hmm. So that really insulates our small community. Any you, questions so far? Yeah, yeah I was just gonna I was just gonna jump in too before we go on. Any mm -hmm. any questions or comments? I'm assuming your changes when you talked about models and visions earlier, does that enhance the timeline? It does can. It, does it? it can. It can. It can also. Um, it can also uh, truncate the timeline in some ways, uh, because sometimes you you may come in with a certain amount of funding, or you may come in where someone uh, where an organization might be like, we're going to provide the building for you. Um, and um, and so, you know, your site acquisition and your fundraising timelines might be shorter. Um, you still you're still going to need to do community and member engagement. Um, but so you know that old oh traditional we used to be able to say oh this typically takes this many months or weeks and this you know so you can see some parts truncated. Um, there will be some complexity added in others. So it's you know and uh, you know. Adam Schwartz, who we all used to work with, has a great saying. He said, you've seen one co-op, you've seen one co-op. So each of your, you know, as similar as some of your projects might be, they're also going to be different. And and so putting together that sort of development timeline, you start with, well, this is what is traditionally seen. It's like, oh, you're going, you know, these are the factors that you're going to have. This, you know, things are going to, to stretch and shrink, you know, for individual projects as well. And so we, what we used to consider like, you know, a little bit of a working timeline, because we're gonna update because you have your construction timeline, your architect's timeline, equipment vendors and all of that. The places that we're seeing the additional time is equipment, right? So it used to take six months to get something, now it's a year. And that's just something we have to deal with. But we can mitigate some of that by doing a very detailed, awesome plan that we don't vary from. All right, so. Does anyone know what programming is in terms or in the context of store design? Yes, all right, so for those of you that don't know, it's essentially um, what you sell and how you sell it. And if you go a little bit deeper, it's in why are you selling it this way and where are you coming up with that data? So one of the biggest things we're seeing is differences in layouts. So labor and adjacencies are more critical than they ever have been and that's because it's going to cost you more if you have, say, your produce prep across the side of the store, right? So you can have your produce department over here and your receiving over there and then produce prep over there. The amount of labor it takes to get that product off the truck into your backstop or onto your floor 
is huge if you're talking about paying someone 5% more than you would have a year ago. So while we used to like accommodate for those and be like, yeah, it's, you know, it's okay, it doesn't matter that much, now we're like, you need to have it there and really figure that out. Um, we worked with a project who, was a co-op that wanted to um, have a shared <coughs> trash and refuse area and it was across the parking lot. So we were able to say, well, it's not typically something that would work in doing labor schedules, Let's figure out how much money that's going to cost the store. And we figured out it was $67,000 a year to pay someone to walk from receiving, mm -hmm. and this is multiple people, multiple times a day, over to the parking lot. Well, that's a salary. And if you do all of those inefficiencies in your plan and you have more than one, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars in additional labor per year. So you need to really take that into consideration. And your store planner will do this with you. It's not something you all have to like, sit down and figure out but it is a newer trend. Uh, we're seeing more backstock and uh, more walk-in, like cooler space. Uh, and a lot of that is because of the supply chain disruption, you might want to place larger orders, right? There are yeah. truck For shortages, example. they're just not showing up on time. All the stocks are different every day. Um, yeah, yeah, for yeah. example, what we did during COVID, um, people weren't coming into the store, so we closed down our cafe and we just made it backstock. And backstock is just, we made larger orders and we just filled the cafe with pallets of food and groceries. Yes, that was dead space for us now. And so, and there are times, and it's because, you know, you, you can't point a finger at some of the distribution companies because they have the same issues that we have, you know, drivers and labor and all this kind of stuff. There are days when at, you know, nine o'clock in the morning, the distribution company calls and says, you're not getting a delivery today because I got five people that are out with COVID. <laughs> right, and you can put in double deliveries too and you might not get it. Yeah. Right, because of their own stuff. Yeah, so it's really important to start, and hopefully this is not gonna be a, a trend that stays with us, but you know, even in any grocery people store. to fill those jobs, yeah. just in our country. You it's always want more backstock and refrigeration. Yep, leaves for just. Yeah, you'll never have enough, but. Yeah, so the main takeaway with the design itself um, is efficiency. And I'll say, it's really easy to put equipment into a store. Like, it's, it's like a little puzzle, right? Um, but unless you have this programming piece and understand how this works, you're just putting pieces of puzzle into a store and making it look pretty. It has to function really well. Um, so one of the things we're really seeing, um, especially in equipment, but you know, all equipment touches operations, is like self-checkouts, right? They're becoming a huge trend. And likely, uh, a lot of the stores that you, you know, maybe do your grocery shopping at now might have a couple. And it may seem like a very good solution, but the things that you need to take into consideration are like, what is labor, right? So you're taking away a long belted register and putting in like two short non-belted registers that are made to do like a $20 basket size where you could do a $200 basket size. Someone has to man that register. Someone still has to be in charge of these checkouts for when customers have questions. So it's not really a labor efficiency all the time, right? Um, also, cost of the equipment. Uh, typical standard register is you know, under $4,000. And then the POS system can be and that's like the, the scanner, the scale, all that stuff. Uh, it can be like 10 to 15,000. We'll think it can be like 30 grand for a self-checkout, right? So you have to think about the cost of that and also the maintenance of it is a lot different than the maintenance of a, you know, a typical checkout. Um, you have more equipment in your IT department if you have self-checkouts. You have different equipment that you haven't done before and that you know we're seeing as a trend, but we don't have a ton of data. Yeah, right, because this is a new trend. Uh, and people yeah. have uh, feelings. Uh -huh. about there's psychology <laughs> that goes in the um, So there's lots of that, <laughs> but you know, we're not advocating, we're just saying, look, this is what we're seeing, and we're, you know, it's it's obviously in conventional stores, and we're seeing we're seeing uh, some movement to looking at it in, in some of the co-ops, and um, so it's like, well, we're here to call out the trends we're seeing, and, so you, some very much have the idea that look, this is a this is a you know this is a service. You know, people want this now, and 
Um, so we're providing a service for our customers and our community by doing this. And some feel very much against it that we're uh, we're eliminating labor, we're eliminating that that face to face yeah. interaction. Um, and so that'll be, you know, if you haven't developed your store yet, that's probably going to be something that that'll be talked about as you get into the design phase, and something that that the board was going to have to really consider. It's like, well, what is our community going to want? What's going to work here? What's you know, and what does it mean to have it? And what's the story we tell about having it so we can communicate our choice and our decision? Because not everyone's going to agree with whichever way we go. And so, how do we communicate that and talk about that? Yeah, and how do you do your research, right? Like you can go out in the community, and you know, we do competitive analysis when we you know start on a project, and you might go out there and be like, well, no one's doing this. I'm going to do this. They might not be doing it for a very good reason, <laughs> right? And so you have to have more member engagement. And like current member engagement and current data is incredibly important. So if you did say um, some facilitated event five years ago or even two years ago, that data is no longer viable because of all of the chain disruptions that we've had. Their shopping patterns have changed. What they want have changed. And so being in contact with your membership and really engaging them in your store development process is more critical than it's ever been before. And it's super fun, because well, they have a lot to say. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really important that, um, that we are reaching everyone in the community that we want to reach, and that we have, uh, we have diverse voices in the room. Um, that doesn't always happen. Um, because there's there's an amount of not to dig too deep into this, but you know there's a, there's an amount of you know doing doing the work of organizing is hard work and it's volunteer work, and it means if you're able to do that, you have a certain amount of privilege in your life. You probably aren't working two jobs uh, with a kid at home and um, things like that that other people might have. So you might not have their voices in the room. So you might have a you might have a core group that has a certain set of life experiences. And so you need to be sure that it's like, okay, this grocery store is gonna work, not just for those of us who are privileged enough to be able to serve on the board, who have that time and availability of however our life has, has worked out, but also the community we wanna serve and find a way to, to remove the barriers for their participation in the process and so we can really build a store that's gonna serve the community. And that might mean going out differently than you have before, right? It might be going out into that community or recruiting people from those communities onto your board or onto some of your committees, right? Um, we really can't stress how important that is to bring in all the people that you want to shop in your store. We can't make assumptions that just because we built it, they will come, right? If it's you've alienated them without intent, or if they feel not welcome in your store, say it's like a first generation immigrant, they want their language, they want their food, they want to feel comfortable. And in order for us to accommodate that and serve the entire community, we have to know those things so that we can build it into our store development process. Okay. So we defined what program was early on. Um, I'll remind you what you sell and how you sell it. In case, yeah. case you haven't memorized it, we want to make this pop quiz. Okay, so, and, and a really simple example is, it's the it's the menu in prepared foods. Mm. That's program. You design your menu. Okay. So, when we when we start to to uh, look at, for example, prepared foods, I mean, what uh, one of the the things that's not a trend, and I I want to say this loud and clear, are systems. Systems don't, haven't changed during this pandemic to a large degree. Does everybody know what I mean when I talk about systems? No. So for fun, I'll just I'll make a, a short joke here. When we talk about prepared foods, what's the most important thing that we do with prepared foods? Can anybody tell Other me? Other than eat it. What's that? <laughs> Other than eat it? Well, I'm Thank just you. have it available. <laughs> have it available. What else? Safe handling. Safe handling. Because that's really the, the, the end of my joke. Our job is not to kill anybody. Okay? <laughs> the most important thing. Not 
don't kill anybody. Because in prepared foods, it's a chemistry project, right? Mm -hmm. So when I say that, what do I have to do with my prepared foods department with regards to systems to ensure that that doesn't happen? We have to make sure it all works. I mean, your temperatures have to be where they need to be. Or, you know, training. Training. Yeah, well, there's training and all that stuff with you. So when I, when I, when I develop my menus, I have to re have recipes for them. They have to be standardized. They have to be costed. Mm -hmm. Really important things to say and to train everybody like, here's the recipe. Don't change it. Just because you like, you know, I like more pine nuts in my pesto, or I like, I want to change out the nuts. I want to put a different nut in there. No. You can go home and do that. Yeah. Right. 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 Simplify. Yeah. Consistency is yeah. You want, you want consistent product. Okay, don't leave me in charge. And, and especially, you know, again, labor shortage comes into this too. If we're tighter on labor, then we need to simplify. Right. And what we mean by that is say, okay, so we have a big uh, eight foot grab and go cooler. It has five decks in it, right? And we want to. Four shelves and the bottom part. Yes. Yeah. We want to we want, we want keep that filled. Right? We don't want it, you know, back to that other slide that was completely empty. We want this thing full, filled. So there's, there's uh, systems in place where you can monitor what your sales are. And you're gonna take your best sellers and you want them in that case all the time. And you may say, I might have some items in there that are not great sellers and their time stuff sucks for my staff to produce. So I'm just gonna double face the best sellers. Right? So, you know, you have to take that approach when you start to look at um, certain programming pieces. We're also going to have to design for minimal staff. And for your menu. One of the biggest things we run across is people are like, well, just put in a standard kitchen. There is no standard kitchen. If you were going to have a burrito program, we have to put in the equipment for a burrito program, mm -hmm. right? And you have to know how many burritos you need to sell to meet your sales projections. And that is not just we're going to sell 15, right? It's like, it's your labor, it's your cost, it's the systems that you know, Kevin's talking about, and once you have all of those figured out, then we start the design for it, which everyone's gonna hate. New York and Texas gonna be like, well, just give me an idea. Right. I'm like, I'm sorry, but a convection oven is different than a range, and you can do different things in that. And so what she's saying is, and I'll just pre-warn everybody, you, you can design a kitchen before you design the menu, but that's really not the way to do it. Can and should are two very different things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and this is a tough process because it's it's the it's the fine line we walk. Do you want to bring in somebody to help design your menu first and then design your kitchen and 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 then pay them this whole time, or do you want to frame out the kitchen and then design your menus, but know that you might have to change your kitchen layout a little bit later down the line and then deal with the you know all the other time, issues. Right? Um, I always think of store development as a, as a very iterative process where, you know, we start with, okay, we've got a pretty good idea here because we need to know, we need to know the space to know what we're going to sell and we need to know what we're going to sell to know what to do with the space. And so it's always this, okay, we, we get a little more refinement here, then a little more refinement here and a little more, and, but there's more than two tracks going. There's like three, four, five different tracks. And so we, we, and we have to keep them all kind of moving together so one doesn't get too far ahead of the other. So all these things can, can all just make sense together so we keep those efficiencies, we keep those systems working. Yeah, but, and you, go ahead. Of, so speaking about the iterative process, I get the idea of designing the menu before you design the kitchen, but the menu, your menu surely isn't static. Because you have your launch menu and your intention, but you're gonna change it as you see what sells or see exactly. what the community responds to. So, yeah, exactly. So how do you say, oh, I'm gonna, here's my menu? Well, you know, you have to- It sounds like, so finite when you put it like that. Yeah, and you, we could go really deep into this, Grant, but it's it's framing, like, you, you're gonna know what your customers want. It's good. You're gonna do a lot of this community engagement, and you're gonna see what they, what they want, right? And then you're gonna take that, you're gonna distill it, and say, okay, so we're gonna have grab and go, we're gonna have, we want made to order sandwiches, we maybe want a food bar or whatever. You have enough 
criteria so now. The menu is like at a big sort of a big. Yeah, yeah, you have yeah, the, the rest of yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not. Okay. I'm not looking at. Oh, but you can change your soup recipes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Without yeah. needing to change your soup equipment. Because yeah. you know, because if you make for you know, here's a really good example. You decide that you're not going to do fried foods. You're just not going to do it. So you're not going to put in a fry. Right. But you know, a lot of uh, design people would say, well, you, you probably need a fryer, you probably need this, you probably need that. But if you made the decision not to fry foods, you don't need to put in a fryer. Yeah. And if you, you know, and it needs to go under a hood, right? right. So if yeah. it like, produces grease, it just has to. So you, we can leave extra space for some of that flexibility, you know, knowing that we might add some programs. But you know, if you're going to do sandwiches, you're going to need a sandwich prep area. Whether you do made to order or whether you prepackage, you can also do like some of your, you know, just prep of your vegetables on there. So there's some crossover, but it's you just don't want to spend thirty thousand dollars on a piece of equipment that you don't think you're going to use. And you can always add in those pieces as you get some of like the data after running your store or some of the feedback from your, your customers. Yeah. Um, you're also going to see, you know, more self-serve options because you know, again, it's a labor issue. Um, all right, uh, more programming stuff. Um, in grocery, um, we're seeing uh, more of a focus on convenience. Um, so uh, people, uh, a lot of shoppers are wanting to get in and get out. Which um, is difficult for your operations because at your sizes, you often can really only staff like one or two registers, right? So if you then have a register in your deli, that is a full-time position, that is more equipment, that is more security issues. So trying to figure out a way to have those adjacencies be efficient, like maybe you have your express lane closer to your deli, kind of eliminates that additional labor that you'll need to make it convenient for people. Yep, uh, we're seeing less options in grocery, fewer SKUs. Um, and and again, like Kevin said, you know, so maybe instead of instead of you know four different products, we whittle down you know four different similar products. We whittle down to the two best sellers, and and we're using the same space on the shelf, but you've got you've got double facing of your two best sellers instead of providing the broader range. Does and, everyone know what double facing or what a facing is? It's like a line of products. So when you go to the store and there's like all the really pretty cans, right? You'll see like green beans and then like you know lima beans or whatever and you'll see like maybe one or two rows of it those are the facings so we would double those two is you know typically what we would do for like really high selling items like your top sellers and then like maybe one facing of others you might not like have three now of just your top sellers rather than all the variety and and let me say this because uh because i'm an operations person and dave olson is here some of this stuff you don't have to do all by yourself. NCG has great programs and they'll do some of the research, research for you. They have a core sets program that said, here's the top sellers in your region. This is what you should have. So it takes some of the legwork out of it and it's, and it's a really good labor savings. And, and they even come in and reset that display for you. Yeah, we really like having you on on our projects at the end. We we'll, really will come in and help set up your store. So, right? yeah, so, you know, you, you, you sit here and you say, oh, man, this is just, like, my eyes are blazing over. I can't. There's a lot of support out there. And that's, it's really important to recognize that up front. Um, oh, right size, and right sizing your bulk. Um, so how, how bulk is is going in the industry. Yep. Everybody know what bulk is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that has shifted a lot over the last couple of years. We imagine it'll continue to shift. Um, we went through a period where we shut down our bulk, um, and now most of it is back, and and the buying trends have shifted from pre-COVID to now. So we just need to be on top of that and, and know our, again, know our customers. And the biggest one really is rather than having a lot of the bulk bins or like stuff that you would serve yourself, a lot of prepackaged bulk, which you do in your back room, right, um, is what is being seen now. Yeah, yeah. I always used to do the. I used to fill my own bag of cashews, and and now 
you know, they've got them that. repacked, and so I'm doing more of that. But that means more labor. And exactly. storage. Problems. All right, you are catching yep. up. Exactly. <laughs> how, how all I mean, these subtle changes yeah, affect. And so there's always going to be trade offs. And, right. and you know, you can even do it a different way. Rather than prepacking it, you could buy it pre packed. Mm -hmm. But now it costs more. Yeah. So your cost of goods goes up. So yeah. there's maybe, a fine line. Here. Oh, but maybe the cost of goods, how much it goes up, is less than the right. cost of the labor. Right. Yeah. Right. So you got to do that, 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 that detail. Um, again, we talked about this before, uh, produce, more of a focus on local to try and eliminate those, well, okay, so much stuff is grown on the West Coast, and um, if there are wildfires, drought, drought um, you know, right but if we're focusing on local, less impact there, and of course also seasonal, um, a higher focus there instead of, uh, and, and, and of course it's, it's interesting, I'm just going to do a little side tangent here. Um, you know, with natural food stores, you know, there's always been um, there's always been such a huge focus on um, local and seasonal, um, and and of course, usually their their number one and two best sellers traditionally have, have been um, bananas and coffee. So, um, am I am I am I right there? Am I right there? Bananas and coffee. Yeah, yeah. Um, and for most of us, especially in this region. We don't have a lot of coffee growers in Wisconsin here. What um, about bananas? Do you have bananas? Yeah, no, no, no. I think I think the I think the banana farm went out of business during COVID. Yeah, and they and they, the the great analogy most uh, operators of, of co-ops will say you can put bananas any place in the store, people will find them <laughs> because they want to they want bananas. It's it's always one of the number one sellers. Can I yeah. rewind slightly? I'm just curious as I continue to think about that bulk thing. If it all moves towards this prepackaged bulk, like how is it bulk anymore? Yeah. Right. So you're, that's a great point, mm -hmm. Grant. It's a, and that's the extreme of it. And part of it is you know, identifying what your core members want, right? right? So what we've seen in, in the last probably five years, um, and I don't want to, you know, throw any generation under the bus, but... It's mine, I'm going to be real pissed. <laughs> but we're seeing a trend, you know, a lot of younger folks don't want to scoop things. Their time is valuable. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, here's one of the reasons they say this. If I scoop it, I don't really know what it's going to cost me yet mm -hmm. until I get to the register and it gets weighed. Budget. But if I, if I look at it, I'll, oh, this is $3.50, I'm, I'm getting this. That's, it's a time convenience piece for them. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what my generation used to think about was like, yeah, this is less plastic, this is, you know, it's cheaper, it's... It's an experience. Yeah. <laughs> you know, now it's, it's time, it's convenience. It's one of the, you know, as we come out of COVID, um, my curbside program, which is, you know, we pick and shop for people, um, some people are just unit doing it now because it's convenient. I'm running around with my kids, they're all you know, playing five different sports, and I can place my order online, I can pick. I can say, hey, I wanna pick it up at two o'clock, but if I don't pick it up at two o'clock, I can still pick it up at four o'clock. It's a convenience thing. Mm -hmm. You know, We don't make any money at it, we consider it a member benefit, but it's convenient. So you know, those are the, the kind of things, Grant, that really, you, know, you have to look at what your community wants and what their needs are. And what, the, and what your mission is, because bulk can be one of the areas in which accessibility, price and accessibility really come into play as well. Um, and um, and it's, it's interesting, you, you mentioned curbside. Uh, that, that was another one of the you know things along with like self-checkout. It's like curbside, well, how much, how much of that is gonna stay or go away or that will be something for us all to consider and keep an eye on as we go forward. And it's like, how much do we plan for this? How much do we not? Um, you know, Kevin said it's not it's not necessarily going to be a moneymaker. Um, and yeah. it's a bulk too. So I think part of what your question was is how is it still bulk? A lot of it is the process of buying and selling, right? right? Yeah. So like it's buying in, in bulk. bulk and breaking it down. And then your so customers able to sell. Yes. The, 
consumer's experience yeah. and the opportunity to, right. to buy a smaller quantity or a larger quantity. Yeah, yeah uh, that's or, like the bulk. Or fill their own. What do you see in yeah. the fill your own? So that's Coffee, a great point. Yeah, we we beans, actually like uh, promote things. that. We're actually saying you bring your own container. Yeah, because everybody wants. We're gonna we're gonna give you like a five percent discount. You bring your own right. container, and we're gonna discount it for you. Because yeah. we want to promote that. It's less packaging for us. Yeah. It's less you know yeah. less time for us. And and that's working. It's it's working. Okay. But also, like I've been in groceries since I've been sixteen years old. I very rarely actually buy bulk because I'm one, I'm the generation that are like I don't have time. <laughs> right? Like I've got two jobs. I've got kids at this point, like I had college, you have to like get places. I just don't buy a lot of bulk, right? So knowing the demographics of your community, like they said, is really important. Right. To wrap up a couple things for the cost, you know, you're bringing up curbside, prepackaged, bulk, and bulk. You're talking about you know your store layout, what you can do away with on a certain condition. How do you, how do you allocate the space that it's, it's an accordion. Mm -hmm. We need the space, we don't need the space. We have a pandemic, well, we, we need to eliminate this and, and create prepackaged meals and you know, curbs. Yeah. How do you plan oh, specifically? That's my yours? favorite part. Yeah. Great. So, like I said, yeah. I've been in grocery for over 20 years. I've designed like 700 stores across the country and in other countries. I know grocery, right? So, when I take a look at data and market studies and I do competitive analysis and this group, you know, like I'll be honest, Kevin does, you know, the deli design. I just put equipment in there um, at this point, and uh, I know what national trends are. I know what mixed trends are. So, like, it's conventional. If you have, say, twenty-five percent of your store is conventional, seventy-five is organic or natural. What like contribution to sales that I would allocate to each department is going to be different. And but there are standards, right? Like NCG has bundles. There are standards within the co-op industry. But we're coming across with all of these new store formats, the data's not there yet. So then you need to have an experienced grocery person that has been pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, or post-shutdown, however you want to put that. They're going to know what is going to work for your store, and then they're going to put in more flexibility. Right, and it's going to be, and it's going to be, it's going to be a conversation. Mm -hmm. Lots of conversations. You know, it's not, it's not like you don't want, you don't want a store designer to come and say, here's your store design, you know. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be coming, and we're going to talk, and we're going to talk priorities. What's the mission? You know, what is it you're trying to achieve? What's your vision? And then we bring our experience and expertise to the table, and then we come up with something that you know that you're like, yes, this is what we want to do, and we're like, yes, this will work. It'll have the efficiencies, it'll have the flexibilities, it'll have all this, that sort of stuff. And you know, the pre-planning uh, piece, the pro forma and things like that, are very important in this because. They're gonna say, you know, uh, fifty percent of your sales are gonna be grocery sales, right? And then you're gonna say, okay, so what kind of space do we have to allot to grocery to generate fifty right. percent of the sales? How many linear feet of shelving? Space? You gotta build in flexibility. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah. That's really what it is. And and then you're gonna to say to yourself, okay, how big is the curb? You know, we're gonna look at this and say, how big do we want curbside to be? You know, what kind of percentage of sales is it's going to be, and you know, do we build in that flexibility? Yeah. Like, I think build most in a people system for curbside. Yeah. If you're going to do one percent of your annual sales, your store planners should know that. Yeah, and you know, curbside has only become relevant for the most part in the last three years. I I look at this and say, right now we're we're forecasting this is just going to be a member service. Yeah. We're doing three percent of our sales currently is is curbside. And what were you doing during the pandemic? Uh, we were doing seven, nine, ten, and and here's a here's a really fun fact for you. Out of that three percent, which is you know X number of dollars, uh, two percent of all our curbside sales during the pandemic was chocolate. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, I was that. I was absolutely astounded when I started to drill down and say two percent of all of our car curbside sales was chocolate. Um, question, Kevin. What is your average basket size in your store? So it's between probably and, and it, this changes seasonally, yeah. but average is probably 
right around sixty dollars, someplace oh. in there. You know, you know, high fifties, low sixties. But during the holidays, yeah, yeah. it just might be like twenty-five to thirty. Yeah, right. and you'll work with your store planner on that, which comes a lot from sales projections and you know data from previous projects. So and everybody knows what basket size is, right? No. Good question. Yeah, and so basket size is. Is, is what the average customer spends okay. in your store. And it's, you know, the funny thing, I, per visit. Per visit, per per visit. visit yeah. yeah. Per visit. So the vernacular really doesn't, some people might be from the hospitality industry, some people might be from the hotel industry, but they all track the same thing. In, in, a, in a hotel, it's occupancy rate and average uh, daily rate. In a, in a restaurant, it's average check and average cover. <laughs> You know, we're, we, we follow those same things, we just call them different. Yeah. Right. And then so knowing how many customers are going to be projected to come into your store every day really helps with those systems. Peace can be like, all right, so I'm going to have 200 people, 150 people come in per day, right? And a lot of that's based on your sales projections and, you know, trends in the area and competitors and all that kind of stuff. A lot goes into it. Then you say, okay, here's my basket size. You can start to figure out, like, what departments have to do in their sales and how much you have to sell of your product in order to meet those sales projections per department. Mm -hmm. And that's your store planner, but it's really fun to sit through that process so you can understand um, how to build those systems with them. Yeah, because you can actually, you can sit down and break down a department. So prepared foods, for example, you, know, you can have a sub department. This is grab and go. This is sandwich made to order. This is soup. This is you know, whatever you're selling. And then then you can start putting the puzzle together, say, okay, the average basket size for prepared foods is this. And then you can say, okay, and that consists of you know, a sandwich from Grab and yeah, Go. Yeah, we only have 10 minutes. Yeah. So, you gotta get to like the how to be ready, because that's the yeah. like non gluten so, Obviously, we can talk, yeah. so. Yeah. yeah. So how do you be ready? Start very early, right? We're starting earlier on these processes, the store development, you know, working with your architect, um, your store planner to come up with those iterations of your plan just start that a lot earlier which everyone will like because i'm telling you every project you're like mechanical electrical plumbing people want information like months before you have it right because you have to build in all of this programming in order to get your equipment specified and that's really what they care about they don't care about shelling um work with data but appropriate data so you need to update your market studies if you've done it pre-pandemic, as you can tell, it's shifted so much that your sales projections and the assumptions are probably going to be different. So if you're working from something old, you can, but you take the risk of it being inappropriate or inaccurate data. Um, work with people that have success in grocery stores. Architects oftentimes say, like, oh, I can do this. But if they've never done this process before and multiple times with success, right, and success is not opening the store, it's staying open. Or, you know, I wouldn't consider a store like a success story until like three to five years of being open, right? Um, so you need to work with people that have been pre-pandemic planners and post-shutdown. Well, and even within that, there's a difference between, you know, large conventional yes. and, and, you know, the development of a large conventional and development of, of a co-op. And a lot of that distribution is so incredibly different. They have distribution centers. So they don't have to order five pallets of something. Well, you're not gonna order five pallets of something. But they don't have to really think about having out of stocks as much because they have one warehouse that is serving all of their stores in the region. So a store planner that is not a natural food store, independent food store planner, is working off those assumptions. And they don't know. Like, I couldn't design Whole Foods. I don't know what it goes into designing a whole food store, right? I only know small format stores, independents, and co-ops. So working with someone that doesn't understand that is a risk. You can do it. Like, I'm not saying you have to do it, but you just need to know the risks that are associated with that. Um, stay up to date on the trends, which a lot of it will be, you know, based on your community and, you know, um, member in input and data, um, updated feasibility and performa. Um, I think that's, yeah, all stuff that we've talked about. We, we did talk about systems, and, you know, we, we don't need to necessarily do that. But 
all the systems really have to be in place before you open. I mean, it's not because. Um, and we didn't talk about monitoring those systems. Right, but so you have programming and produce, and grocery, and you know all these other departments. So all those systems have to be in place because. Um, <clears throat> it's prepared. Yeah, yeah. Um, because you you know you have to. You have to put your food specs together. You know, you have to, when you order, like for example, if you're going to be making salsa, you don't need to buy grade A tomatoes. You can buy seconds. You know, so you have to develop all those systems, and you'll have people in place. But monitoring is a really important component. You can't just say we open the store and we're selling stuff and we our sales are great. But if if it, if you're not monitoring your cost of goods sold your labor percentage, your sales, you could just be bleeding money. Just, you know, just hemorrhaging cash as you go along. So you have to have the monitoring systems in place as well. And so one of the great things about, and maybe one of the only great things about the store development during the, the pandemic is we have seen that we just have all of this done way earlier than we had before. So yeah, there are going to be a lot of circumstances where you're adding months onto your timeline. There are other things you can be doing, right? Like you're gonna be worried about training staff. You're gonna be writing your food standards. You're gonna be doing your interior design. You're gonna be like doing community engagement. So there's all of these things that this, most of it, you don't have to do. You have to be a part of, but you don't have to understand all of this. You have people that are gonna help you. You have support systems. And then you're able to translate that into your community and start gathering more engagement and participation. So um, for me, the big takeaway is if you have good systems in place um, and you've got good process and good support, having that foundation means that um, you'll be able to shift and adjust as things change or as um, you know, as your original plans may not come out exactly, it's like okay, well, we thought we thought this was going to be a big seller, maybe it's not, or or however things however things shift and change. If you've got good systems and good process in place, you'll know and you'll see you'll see the changes. And during the store development, right? good process, good communication, good support will really set you up for success. Those are the outcomes we went through. We've got time for a few more questions, and of course, um, we're here. A couple things uh, before we see if we have more questions. Um, we've got we've got a little sheet here on store development services. We've got a little postcard here if you have. Do your survey, right? Our survey. Table. Yep, and then uh, you've got Done. surveys to fill out, and we've got a few more minutes for for group questions here, and you can always uh, grab us uh, later as well. Um, I have a question about the curbside. So you need a space where they can organize those yes. orders. Yeah, so so what we've done in, in our program, and you know, I have to say, uh, before the pandemic, um, our IT department said, we will never do curbside. <laughs> <laughs> pandemic came, and we did curbside. I think we had it up and running in like a month. <laughs> but so, so part of our point of sale system has has a curbside can, a model to it. Oh, okay. So we bought the, the model for that. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is some, and then we, you, you build it into your website. Um, people can go to your website, they place an order. And what's, what's great about curbside, for the most part, is they pay for that in advance. Oh, right. You know, they're paying for it right up front. And so then what we do, somebody actually picks the, the products. Mm -hmm. um, and with the payment piece, it's um, it's not fully finalized until you finish picking because if there's weight items, you know you have oh, to yeah. you have to change it. So, but anyway, so we t we took over our cafe register that we normally would use, and we that's our staging area. Uh, we put all the food, we bag it all, we put it in these totes, and then we split it up into the refrigerator and the freezer. And then we have a sheet that says you know, the person's going to pick it up at four o'clock, and psh, they they pull up out front. We have phone numbers on the side of the building. They call the phone number. The person who's working curbside just answers it and just brings it out. And design-wise, like this is one good thing about curbside. And that way, 
you can always give that space back to another department. They will take it. Yeah. So if you yeah. want to build in for those systems, and you do a lot of cross-training with your staff, right? So like you might have one staff person dedicated to curbside, but they also may be like going into other departments mm -hmm. when they're, you know, it's not a busy time. And if it's something that just doesn't work or you're finding that um, everybody else has curbside and you really don't need it or whatever that is, yeah. Or she will take that space. Yeah. Don't do, worry. Do you find uh, Goodwill credits, um, you know, replacement products, missing products? Does that ever come in to, as a strong factor? No. I mean, we we um, so for me, my background is is systems. So you know, you anticipate a lot of those in, in advance, Jerry. So for example, you know, we we actually put a, a sheet of paper in every curbside order that says. We don't have this today. And, and to then, a certain extent, it's integrated yeah. into your POS system, right? Yeah. So if you have like updated inventory um, or like live in inventory, perpetual tests, inventory, yeah, yeah perpetual inventory, um, that's pretty helpful. Yeah, and then you don't have to do that as much. And there are different <clears throat> models for curbside. Like we actually deliver it. Some places have like refrigerated storage units out in front, and then they get a code and they, you know, they okay. they put the food in that. Like a dedicated room. Yeah, and there's different ways to do this. Um, we we went into it thinking that you know this is not going to be one a money maker, two we want to make it as, as efficient as possible, and three it's never going to be a large portion of our sales. It's it's solely we looked at it as a member service, and and we've actually promoted it during COVID as. Now, our actually our membership numbers went up because we had curbside in place. Yeah. Yeah. Like oh, Briar Patch, which is my local co-op, does thirty-seven million dollars a year, um, and my partner is the ops manager. So when I ask him about curbside, he's like, "Well, we used to like five percent of our sales were curbside. Now it's one percent, but our net profit is zero. But if they didn't have it, then they would lose some of that membership. So there's like a very fine line that you walk, and it is a program that you can adjust as you are open." So that's, yeah. that's good news. Yeah, because we went from 8,000 members, a little over 8,000 prior to COVID, we're over 10 now. Yeah. And we look at that, a large component of that was... Um, yeah, prior yeah. patch went up 4,000, they're at 16,000. When, you, when you're saying it's a member benefit, are you saying it's only available? Yeah. You are. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's why the membership increased. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, but like at prior patch, it's not. Anybody can get it. Just have to order it online. So it, it'll be it'll it's something that like you you'll work with your store planner on to figure out if you want it and how's the best way to provide it. Yeah.